Welcome. In this video, we'll look at how we use limit rules to justify and calculate limits. Limit rules provide a method to use our known limit equations in order to create new limit equations. Suppose that I know a limit of an f of x, that's one function, and I know a second function, g of x. The limit of f is l, and the limit of g is m. And here f and g could represent any expressions that I know their limits. Then the limit rules, the sum, difference, product, quotient, and constant multiple rules, allow me to calculate limits that are formed by adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, or scaling these original functions. So we'll be using these um, in order to calculate limits. Because each of these rules is justified through a proof, any results that come from these are guaranteed to be true. Note that for the quotient rule, the denominator limit cannot equal zero. In order to construct new limits, we need a starting point. This is where elementary limits come in. Elementary limits are limits that are known to be true, limit equations that we know are true in every situation. And we don't need to do any extra proof. There are two basic functions that we always have limits of. A constant function, where the limit has a constant inside. As x goes to any number, the limit is always that same constant. The second is the identity function. The identity function is just the variable, f of x equals x. So if x by itself is in a limit, and x is going to a number, then the limit is that number x is going to. This is the limit of the identity. These are our basic elementary limits. Now a comment about using limits. It's tempting to look at this equation and think and sort of ignore the limit part and think it says x equals a and somehow think, oh, I'm going to replace x with a. But that's not really what it is. The limit of f of x is actually one object. Um, it can't be separate. You can't talk about lim by itself. You can't talk about x by itself. It's this entire quantity that's an expression. And so, for example, um, as we said, if I say the limit as x goes to a of x equals a, it's not saying x equals a. Okay, the last thing that I want to say before we get to our example, order of operations. When I'm thinking about constructing an argument, I'm going to base it on the same order of operations that the original expression uses in order to calculate. Um, secondly, a limit rule can only combine two expressions at a time. So if I were to go back to the limit rules, each of the limit rules only involves two expressions a sum, a product, a quotient. And so as I get to um, limit rules using combinations, I can only build two steps at a time when I use limit rules. Anything that involves three terms would require at least two steps. All right, we're ready to set up our example. Suppose I know the limit of f of x is divided by x over 2 as x goes to 2 has a value of 8. And I want to calculate and justify the value of a new expression. It's a quotient of 3x squared times f of x all over x minus 2 times x plus 3 as x approaches 2 using our limit rules. Now our strategy is we're going to build up to this final expression. And inside is this function f of x. We don't have a formula for it. We only know a limit of a quotient f of x over x minus 2. So we need to take this basic formula and split it up. And so we recognize that that expression can be written as a quotient f of x over x minus 2 times a quotient 3x squared over x plus 3. And so this the, the given limit input f of x over x minus 2 is now part of my formula and we see it's a product with another term. So we're going to need to use limit rules to find the limit of the other term, 3x squared over x plus 3, and then we'll be able to use the product rule to put it together. So here's a summary of what we're trying to do. My goal is I'm interested in the limit of an expression as x goes to 2, where we're given the limit of one factor of that, 
f of x over x minus 2 has a limit of 8. In order to do that, we realized we needed to calculate the limit of 3x squared over x plus 3. And so that's how we're going to get started. All right, we start with our elementary limits. We know that our formula involves x, and so we need the limit of x. And the identity function, if x is going to 2, the limit is 2. Second, x squared appears in my formula, and x squared is x times x. And so we're doing a limit rule. This is the product rule. The limit of a product is the product of the limits. And so the limit of x squared will be 2 times 2, or 4. Next, we keep building up that numerator, 3x squared. That's a constant 3 times x squared. x squared, we just did the limit. And so the constant multiple rule says we get 3, the constant, times the limit of x squared, which is 4, for a net value of 12. So now we know the limit of the numerator. In the denominator, we have x plus 3. We already have a limit of x, but we don't know the limit of 3 yet. It's not in our list of limits. That's a constant function, and so its limit is 3. Now we have x and 3, and we can add them together. The limit of x plus 3 is the sum of the limits individually. So x had a limit of 2, and 3 had a limit of 3. And so the net value of the sum rule is the limit of the denominator is 5. Now I've got the numerator 3x squared and the denominator x plus 3. I know their limits. The limit of the denominator was not 0. And so I can use the quotient rule. The limit of the quotient is the quotient of the limits, 12 over 5. So I've got the limit of the both factors now. And so I can combine them using the product rule. The limit of a product is the product of the limits. And f of x over x minus 2 has a limit of 8. And 3x squared over x plus 3 has a limit of 12 fifths for a grand final limit of 96 fifths. And we're done. We've started with our given limit and elementary limits, the limit of the identity function and the limit of constants. And through the limit rules, we've constructed limit equations that allow me to result in our final limit that we wanted to get.